Mm -hmm. I think we're ready to go. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Nice to be back in Korea, when, this time of year when the autumn leaves are still out, isn't it? Lovely. I came up from Sydney yesterday, which is quite a long drag, actually, nine and a half hours, and then almost as long getting in from the airport to, to Seoul. <laughs> anyway, finally here. Um, and nice to have the chance to connect with some of you who I've met before. Um, what I want to do today is really going to draw on some of the experience that I've built up working in different kinds of situations. Sometimes I work with new teachers who are just entering a teaching field, new to teaching. And my latest book actually on practice teaching draws on that. How many of you have been teaching for less than, say, two years? Less than two years. <laughs> One or two, okay. So we have some people who are fairly new to teaching. Uh, and uh, how many of you have been teaching for more than um, 10 years? Right, 100 years. <laughs> Okay, so um, I, I work with teachers at different uh, levels of experience. I do things here and there, but part of the year I'm based in Singapore, working at a teacher training centre there, where we work only, uh, not only on uh, the language proficiency of teachers from Cambodia and Indonesia and so on, but also on uh, basic teaching skills and teaching knowledge. So that's what I'm uh, going to look at when I talk about competence and performance in teaching. I'm really going to try to dissect to take apart what does it mean to be uh, a good English teacher. So I'm going to look at a number of different dimensions of professional development, uh, teacher growth, teacher development, teacher expertise, and see how these um, impact upon us at different stages in our professional development. So, um, Back here, so I can see my own slides from here. Yes, so these are what I want to do to look at some of the, what I understand to be the core components of expertise in language teaching. Because people like myself, uh, who are in the field of teacher training, we need to ask ourselves, what is it that people need to know? What is it that people need to learn to be good English teachers? What is it that people need to learn who are not native speakers of English? What is it that native speakers need to learn? So that's one of the questions. And then we'll look at some of the implications for professional development. I'm going to look at 10 different aspects of professional development. This paper is, uh, this talk is on my website. It's very easy to find, so you, if you want to download it, you can. Um, and I'll give you the website address. It's very easy to remember. So we're going to look at 10 dimensions of professional development. I wanted to start with a little disclaimer because uh, when you start talking about teaching, English teaching, is English teaching the same everywhere? Well, no it's not because conceptions of teaching change from one context to another. In other words, what is considered good teaching in a Korean high school might be very different from what's considered good teaching in an Australian high school. So when we look at teaching, we um, sometimes use the notion of situated. In other words, it's very much affected by the context, by the situation by the culture of the school and so on. How are you going to do that? Uh, okay. So uh, let's have a uh, look at a couple of examples. So here's a teacher from the Middle East talking about uh, how he approaches a reading lesson and how in his context the students feel that he should lead them through the lesson. That's the, 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 uh, Korea, the Egyptian teachers understanding what his role is as a teacher. Here is a teacher from Taiwan who again feels that the students feel it's responsibility of the teacher to make learning happen for the students. It's something that the teacher does, that they don't have to do a great deal about it, if you like. Um, here's a teacher in China commenting on the fact that some common activities that we use in language teaching will be perceived differently by Chinese students. They don't think they really show evidence of serious teaching. Communicative activities that involve group work and all of those kinds of things that we that we like to do, they feel look like sort of fill-in activities because the teacher isn't sure what to do with the rest of the lesson. Now, here's a comment by uh, an Australian student studying Chinese in China, commenting on the Chinese approach to teaching. And she says, as you see there, that she feels that because they're so book-bound that they don't really know how to teach. Here, on the other hand, is a chi some Chinese students commenting on Australian teachers. Um, 
Chinese students are expecting a very different kind of teaching, much more teacher-led teaching. And so the Chinese students feel that the Australian teachers don't know what they're doing because they're doing a lot of, if you like, informal learner-based teaching, which the students are unfamiliar with. So I just mentioned those as examples of how conceptions of teaching are often uh, culturally determined. But be that as it may, I want to look at 10 factors that I think we're probably fairly much in agreement with. The first one has to do with language proficiency, because most of the world's English teachers are not native speakers of English. As we know, most of the countries where English is taught have very large populations, like China and Brazil and so on. Um, and the people who teach English in those countries are nationals of those countries, most of whom probably at the best have an intermediate to upper intermediate level of language proficiency. So one of the, one of the issues is what is the connection between language proficiency and how well someone teaches? You don't have to be a native speaker or speak English with a native speaker level of proficiency to be an excellent teacher. In fact, I've seen many excellent lessons taught by teachers with intermediate level of proficiency, and I've seen some dreadful lessons taught by native speakers of English. So there's no connection between language proficiency, between native speaker um, capacity and the ability to teach. In other words, native speakers don't have a special gene that enables them to teach English. But there is a connection between language proficiency and teaching skill, because you have to have achieved a certain threshold level of language proficiency to be able to um, do these kinds of things. These are some of the aspects of teaching, if you like, that are dependent upon language proficiency. If your English is weak, you will not be able to do these things well. And so when we work with English teachers whose language proficiency is low, as I often do, what we're trying to do is to develop their proficiency to the level where they can do these things efficiently. Um, because these are the dimensions of teaching that are language dependent. There are many that are not. You know, the ability to motivate students and manage time and all of those dimensions of teaching that are very generic are not necessarily dependent on language, but these are. Now, what is the impact of low proficiency on teaching? Well, uh, I can give you examples from my own experience. I speak French reasonably well, as I did my PhD in a French language university, and at that time I was able to teach content subjects through French. I couldn't do it now, I must say. But um, and my other language is Indonesian, and I speak that reasonably fluently because I lived there for a while, but only in very restricted domains, certain restricted circumstances. So I could teach both of those languages, but I would be very book-bound. In other words, I wouldn't be able to go much beyond the language of the book. I wouldn't be able to improvise, if you like. And that's one of the essential skills of teachers, to be able to improvise around your lesson plan and build lessons around the dynamics of the moment. And that's what I wouldn't be able to do in Indonesian or French if I was teaching those languages. I'd basically be presenting the language in the book, practicing the language in the book. So that's one of the, uh, the um, consequences of poor language proficiency. So we do need to work on the language proficiency of people who want to become English teachers. We're not trying to turn them into native speakers. That's not necessary. But we do want them to have enough confidence to be able to use English as the medium of instruction in the classroom. Um, one of the reasons is because language proficiency is also closely related to the teacher's sense of identity. What does it mean to be an English teacher? We'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, so these again are the sorts of things that are language proficiency dependent. Now, uh, native speakers on the other hand also need to monitor their language because native speaker language is often full of things that are irrelevant to second language learning classrooms. And so native speakers like myself who've lived outside of English-speaking environments for many years have developed a way to edit out of our language many of the things that are not particularly useful for second language learners. Let me give you a little example. Um, I showed a little video earlier of some concerts I had in my house in New Zealand when I'm there in the summer, fundraising things. And I had a Brazilian student there in the summer um, who was there to prove his English. And one of my neighbors came in and started chatting to this young man and said to him, um, what brings you to Gisborne, Mr. Town? What brings you to Gisborne? And he said, um, well, I flew Lum Chile to uh, Santiago and so on. So he, um, he misunderstood the question to mean how, what means of transport did you come? Now that question, what brings you to Gisborne, is idiomatic. 
In other words, there's no direct connection between the meaning of the words and the meaning of the sentence. Now, that's the sort of English I do not use. I've learned through experience not to use English like that. But many native speakers are not aware of this. They don't realize that a lot of the stuff they say is okay in the context of other native speakers in a little town in Idaho or wherever you are, but has no relevance in, in, uh, home, in um, Korean classrooms. So native speakers have to modify their language, and that's what I learned to do and why um, I don't sound like a typical boy from New Zealand, except when I go back there and then I switch into it. Um, in fact, I was there the other day, last summer, standing at a little market, uh, buying some produce there on the side of the road. It was a Maori woman. The town I come from has a big Maori population, indigenous population, about 70%. Anyway, um, I was chatting to the lady in front of me, and then she said to me, um, Anyway, where do you come from? You, you used to sound like you come out of here, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I used to sound like before I started teaching English. Um, so, we have to learn to be able to monitor our, our language to, to provide suitable learning input, to avoid unnecessary colloquialisms and idiomatic usage. When I first was trained, we were taught to teach a lesson using a 1,000 word vocabulary. And so we were, we were monitored by the trainer, this was in New Zealand, to make sure that it, uh, the language we used did not wander outside what was called the little language. And that was an idea just to force us to monitor and edit our language so that we're providing the sort of input that is appropriate in a foreign language and second language context. Provide a model of spoken English appropriate for students learning English and so on. So there's, there's issues both for native speakers and non-native speakers and you probably, there's a great um, discussion these days about English as an international language and whether native speaker English is a necessary target for learning or whether other varieties of English are also appropriate. The next issue, so that's the first issue, has to do with language proficiency. Um, and as I say, it is an important issue. I was working with some students this uh, last few months from Cambodia and Laos, and Thai, Vietnamese, Khmer, and um, Lao languages have very few final consonants. They only have two or three cons final consonants, as does Cantonese. So those speakers tend to miss off all their final consonants. Now, um, final consonants actually don't have a heavy information, information load to carry in English. You can miss off final consonants and be perfectly comprehensible. We have that book on the table. You can understand exactly what I'm saying. But however, they do great. And also, final consonants affect grammar because they're, uh, they come into the third person. He goes, so on, she walks. So if we miss our final consonants, there's a big knock-on effect in terms of how the language sounds. And so I was working with these students on them, just getting them to recognize that, that these teachers, that there are final consonants in English. Their teachers never used them, and they never used them either. So give them a reading passage. Go through and circle all the words that have a final consonant. Read it aloud to me. Language training, language awareness. So language proficiency is an important issue. The next issue is content knowledge. What do you need to know to be an English teacher? How much linguistics, how much of this, how much of that? And so I teach uh, graduate courses for master's degree students, and that's one of the, one of the things that I do, is I have to make decisions. What is really important to know if you're going to be an English teacher? And that's the sort of things that you study when you start doing course work. And also, how do teachers make use of content knowledge? If I give you this knowledge about English grammar or about second language learning or whatever it is, will you actually be able to use it when you teach? So one of the challenges for people like myself who are a university professor training people at university level is to decide what is useful and what is useless because there's a lot of knowledge that is useless to teachers. Unfortunately, I feel a lot of my colleagues get bogged down passing on information that is interesting to them but has no interest to teachers. So, now, when we talk about content knowledge, we can think about it in two different ways. One body of content knowledge is what really defines the knowledge base of the discipline, core knowledge that relates to the knowledge base. And so, we would say that every English teacher needs to know something about the history of the profession, the history of methods, and so on. 